Here's an idea, and perhaps an unsurprising one. The internet is absurd. This is my favorite image macro. It's a demotivator, there's a giraffe, pointing at a duck, and it says, look at this duck, I am a giraffe. It's just, I mean, how did that duck get there? Why is that giraffe doing that? Who took the picture? Who put the caption on it? And why is it so funny? There's just something particularly internet about the whole thing. And here we'll pause to acknowledge that when I say particularly internet, I mean specifically particularly Western internet given my experience of it. My mother or someone from China or Chile might have a very different sense of what constitutes particular internetness. For me, it's a kind of context collapse. Several things together that until they meet, you would never guess could exist in harmony. Or, I guess, harmony. YouTube poops, mashups, so many funny maymays, and by extension things which have inspired and parroted them, like advertisements, music videos, sitcoms, have all led to an increase, in my eyes, in the prevalence of absurdity in popular culture. A creative tactic where something is made meaningless or irrational on purpose so as to appear silly. Goose and doos. Very recent example, and what will perhaps remain in the pantheon of absurd media, is Adult Swim's Too Many Cooks, which, if you haven't seen it, defies quick summary, so you should just go ahead and watch it. But a word of warning, there is some fake gore in a partially topless woman, so just make sure that your grandmother, your boss, or your boss's grandmother are not in the room. Now, Too Many Cooks creator Casper Kelly, also co-creator of the Adult Swim show Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell, has described his own style as absurdist and dark, according to Entertainment Weekly. And surely it is one type of absurd, constructed to produce disjunction. Seemingly irrational, nonsensical, but still somehow cohesive. But I think that there's another kind of absurd at work here, specifically an example of Albert Camus' absurdism. In his essay The Myth of Sisyphus, Camus sets up an unsettling dichotomy. The world, on one hand, is meaningless. Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. At the heart of all beauty, Camus writes, lies something inhuman. And these hills, the softness of the sky, the outline of these trees, at this very minute, lose the illusory meaning with which we had them clothed. Henceforth, more remote than a lost paradise. But regardless of the absence of this meaning, people are always searching for it, even though it's not there. Ultimately, any meaning or reason that we see in the world is simply ours. It is not the world's. No code of ethics, no effort are justifiable a priori in the face of the cruel mathematics that command our condition, Camus wrote before downing his espresso and taking a long drag on his cigarette as his eyes scan the ocean's horizon for any speck of meaning that he knows truly will never appear. Absurdism is born from the relationship between humanity's constant search for meaning and the universe's complete lack of any. Camus compares modern life to Sisyphus in the Greek myth, rolling a boulder up a hill, only to have it roll back down again for eternity. Likewise, we perform our mundane tasks, life, job, over and over and over. Both us and Sisyphus can only find meaning, contentedness, in admitting that this is what life is, repetitive and absurd. So you just grin, bear it, and you roll your boulder. It's convenient, then, that Too Many Cooks is mostly a send-up of late 80s, early 90s sitcoms. Shows like Family Matters, Full House, Family Ties, The Cosby Show, all highly moralistic and hinging on the idea that each family member and their actions are meaningful, that in life there is success, purpose, and reason. And all these shows reuse tropes to that end in the same way that Sisyphus pushes his boulder. Over and over and over and over. And a fact echoed sort of by too many cooks' use of repetition. That is, until things start going... awry. The cast members go about their posing, Chiron adorned, until the point at which the antagonist, looking sort of like if you were to cast Slavoj Žižek as the creepy uncle, starts slaughtering them, crumbling setting and context and reaching peak absurdity with Chiron people adorned with screaming people Chirons. Too Many Cooks reads to me not as an illustration of absurdism, but maybe as a kind of warning against failing to acknowledge it. Uncle Žižek is a dispassionate force acting without clear reason, and the cast members feel safe in their meaningful roles until the universe shows them that otherwise is the case. But once they're shown the constructed nature of their world, it's already too late. The happily manufactured sitcom broth is already spoiled. Now look. 
Too Many Cooks also has elements of the theater of the absurd, a genre of stage play inspired by Camus' writing. Repetition, of course, characters stuck in awful situations, ironic overuse of tropes and cliches. I know there are some awesome theater nerds who watch Idea Channel, so if y'all are inspired, I would love to hear what you think about this, because to wrap things up, I want to talk about Alex from Target. If you missed it, Alex is a teenager who works at a Target in Texas. A picture of him made its way to Twitter and around, and in no time flat, he had hundreds of thousands of fans for, if you are an old, no reason. The whole thing culminated with Alex taking a trip to meet Ellen and a PR firm claiming, falsely it seems, to have engineered his success from the ground up. Much like has been the case with Too Many Cooks, the Alex from Target think pieces rained down upon the masses, but six days later, at the time of shooting, it's kind of all quiet on the Alex from Target front. Meaningful one day, Monday in the next. And maybe eight days from now when this video goes up, Too Many Cooks will be the same. Maybe not. Maybe it'll experience some version of what we talked about in our old memes video. To put it in terms that the late 90s rock band failure might, perhaps too many cooks will play itself to death in all of us. Guitar riff. Either way, Alex from Target, Twitch Plays Pokemon, Kony 2012, and maybe Too Many Cooks, we'll see, there definitely seems to be this repeated process of intense infatuation, followed by critical response, followed by, hey, what's next in line? Camus named Don Juan as an example of ideal living in the face of absurdism. Don Juan recognized that true love is, in fact, meaningless, and so chose to experience as much passionate love as possible. I don't know that I am entirely on board with that, but what Camus wrote was, what counts is not the best living, but the most living. So maybe that's us? cultural Don Juans or media Sisyphuses rolling our absurd digital boulder only to watch it fall and then return for it again, complacent in its absurdity and so, at the very least, entertained. What do you guys think? Does absurdism arise in our search for meaning in things like Too Many Cooks or Alex from Target? Let us know in the comments and there's no meaning in subscribing, so just don't, don't bother pensive ocean look. Whereof one cannot speak, one should just comment first. Let's see what you had to say about hell and quoting other people. Let me tell you, the games, hell is also only being able to choose six or seven comments to respond to, so I feel your pain, or at least a version of it. Cyrilai Musland hopes that we might eventually do more about Wittgenstein, maybe include some stuff uh, from Russell or Popper, and these are things that I would love to do. I would also just love in general to talk more about analytic philosophy. Um, I've also been thinking lately about how much fun it would be to do an episode format that's like idea people, where we do maybe biographies and explanations of some of the ideas from famous idea havers. I would really love to do an episode about Leon Theremin, um, and just in general, have an excuse to talk excitedly about people that I really like. Is that a thing that you would watch? Would you watch that? Minimus32, who is writing a dissertation on Wittgenstein's relationship to Zen Buddhism, that sounds cool, provides an additional take on um, the seventh proposition in his Tractatus and says that it is also kind of about, or, or alternately about, how um, if thought needs to somehow contain words, that he is also saying that there are limits to what is even thinkable and therefore sayable. Um, so this, yeah, this was a great comment. Links to this one and all the others in the doobly-doo. Eduardo Gonzalez talks about the problem of translation when trying to interpret the works of philosophers and gives um, a perspective from the Spanish translation of the Cogito, which is, I think and then I am, which sort of erases some of the dependency of I think, therefore I am. And yeah, I mean, Nietzsche suggested, I think it was, um, um, it thinks as a as an alternative to uh, to the cogito and um, Ikasan gives this sort of a similar perspective from um, the Buddhist side of things and uh, talks about a um, an Alan Watts quote which is a great one about how um, the the perception of self is kind of audience and actor collapsed into one thing the cogito the cogito the cogito. D. Loventhal offers some clarifications and additions, and first talks about how Descartes was coming at his skepticism trying to um, prove that everything exists as a result of some benevolent god, and that's a very important piece of context for thinking about, I think, therefore, I am. Um, he also talks about Wittgenstein's response to hell is other people, which is um, that hell is not other people, hell is yourself, which is very much in keeping with how Wittgenstein thought about the way that um, we create meaning and uh, the problem 
problems with shuttling it back and forth between uh, between personalities and people in the world. And then finally, um, the the important point that the Tractatus is generally considered part of Wittgenstein's early work, which is really different from his later work. And there were a couple people um, recommending in the comments to also check out if you're interested in Wittgenstein philosophical investigations, which, hey, I agree, it's great. Etienne Deming talks about PMS Hacker's observation that Wittgenstein didn't see concepts as things floating out in the world to be discovered, but rather um, ways for us to use language to sort of crystallize and generate that meaning and um, make some really great points and then goes on to suggest that maybe we should print I exist badges and this, I like this idea of a badge also being a thing that brings someone into existence, like, boop, you exist. I'm gonna think about this. And finally, Hogmagundi asks the really good question of how hell is other people might change in light of the internet and anonymity and works through some of the possible answers to that question. I really love this question and kind of maybe agree with the final thing that Hogmagundi gets to, which is that hell is still other people, just maybe kind of in a different way. We have a Facebook, an IRC, and a subreddit, links in the doobly-doo. The tweet of the week comes from 2UFB, who points us towards a research paper from a mathematician who has proven why hipsters tend to make the same stylistic choices. And I just want to read part of the abstract here. When hipsters are too slow in detecting the trends, they will keep making the same choices and therefore remain correlated as time goes by, while their trend evolves in time as a periodic function. All right. And finally, this week's episode was brought to you by the hard work of these cooks. It takes a lot to make a stew. A pinch of salt and laughter too. A scoop of kids and apple of spice. A dash of love to make it nice. And you've got too many cooks. Too many cooks. Too many cooks. Too many cooks.